Rob, I am feeling like Giannis, I don't know if he's there yet, but I think we're edging there, is becoming the most disrespected superstar of his generation. You laid out some of the case today for why he should absolutely be thrown into the MVP race in every conversation, then it's not just Jokic versus Embiid, which I agree with. But just in general, I, I've never seen people go out of their way to look for more reasons not to declare somebody either the best player in the league or 1B to Durant, if we're going to do that. He answers every question we have in the finals last year. He yep. plays hurt. He comes through on the biggest stages. He has iconic plays. He handles his business the right way. He crushes on both ends. He's the best defensive player in the league. He's averaging 30, 11, and 6. He's carried a team that's had a lot of moving pieces during the year. He never really misses games or seems to get hurt. He's a true freak. He's in the prime of his career. What am I missing? Nothing, as far as I can see. But, all right, most disrespected is a big word this week when Russell Westbrook is getting laughed out of buildings, basically. <laughs> so the threshold has changed a little but, bit. <laughs> but he's earned he's earned the disrespect in a lot of ways. And also, like, absolutely, when you talk a lot of shit and you carry yourself a certain way and then you're on your way down, everybody lines up to get their punches in, right? With Giannis, it's like, people are like begrudgingly respectful for him. And I, I don't really understand it. Maybe I'm arguing with the straw man. I don't know. No, you're not. I mean, just early this season, I think it was Tracy McGrady who was saying, oh, if Giannis played in our era, he would just be another guy. He wouldn't be as effective. It's weird that like you'll hear legends from previous generations say, oh, the Steph Currys couldn't cut it. But also Giannis, the guy who lives at the rim, plays completely inside, totally physical, all energy. I don't know how you can have it both ways. I don't know what they think the sweet spot of their game was that neither of those guys could have thrived. But Giannis is one of those one of those players who... I think in any era of NBA basketball could have been amazing, but is particularly empowered by this one, by putting the ball in his hands, by enabling him in that way. And once you do that, I mean, there's just no turning back. That's how you get to these MVP levels season after season after season to the point where I guess it's old hat at this point. I guess I guess we've already hit the voter fatigue stage at I think he's 27 years old, which yeah. is wild. But uh, he's incredible, an incredible two-way player. Well, what made you want to write this week's piece? What were you seeing that wasn't out there that you're like, I got to do this? Well, I think there's a combination of things. First, it was just the narrowing of the MVP race to Jokic and Embiid. When to me, it was a three, it was a three man pool. It was how are we parsing these three guys, and yep. why is Giannis being boxed out of this conversation? But we're also at the point in terms of awards voting and consideration where it's it's kind of why not season. You know, like why shouldn't I vote? Carl Anthony Towns, all NBA center, third team over Rudy Gobert. Like, why wouldn't I do that? And so it's like, if you're thinking about who the why not MVP pick is, I mean, I think you can make an argument for Luka with how strong he's come on over the back half of the season. But for me, it's Giannis. And it's, you look at every advanced stat and Giannis is right there in the thick of it, usually with Jokic, usually above Embiid. And I mean, it's not a terribly complicated calculus that I arrived at, which is, and we talked uh, talked about this in the piece, if Giannis is right there in the running for the scoring title and he might be the defensive player of the year, how is that guy not the MVP? And his stats are slightly better than Embiid's if yeah. you're just going offense, offense. It's weird. Look, I've been talking about this for, I feel like my whole life that I've had a platform of how the MVP becomes narratives. And people got seduced by the Embiid narrative pretty early on. It doesn't mean that he's not a worthy candidate. Yeah. But he hasn't won before. He took a step up. He's had some game, some nationally televised games where he kicked ass. And I think people, Giannis has reached this weird point where people kind of expect it and it's hard for them to be impressed by him. But I, I'm constantly impressed by him. I, as, as I've discussed many times, I feel like the MVP is always evolving week to week and that's why it's so dangerous to lock into anything before like the last 10 games. Totally. I always felt like it was a three-man race. Last week, I I was definitely leaning toward Jokic just because I'm constantly amazed by how kind of unreliable his team is, you know? And I felt like if the records were all going to be around the same with Milwaukee and Denver and Philly, then we have to think like, all right, now we're going degree of difficulty. Mm -hmm. all, all three guys have credentials. And then de but the thing that's changing with Milwaukee is they're finally starting to play really well. They might end up getting a two seed. They might end up having you know, the third or fourth best record in the league. Who knows? Yeah. And Giannis was the guy that kept it together. And the Middleton-Drew thing, 
that's starting to, that big three piece that they, you know, Middleton was the guy who just wasn't as good this year as he was last year. Post All-Star, I think he's like 26 a game and is looking like Middleton again. So now that's back. Now Lopez comes back. And, you know, I look at it this way. Milwaukee's not going to be scared of playing Brooklyn in round one. I think Philly is. I think Philly's going to do a lot of chicanery to get out of that to potential two spot and move down. Milwaukee will welcome it. And they already know they beat Brooklyn. Now they beat a little slightly compromised Brooklyn, but I think they match up really well with Brooklyn. That's kind of, isn't that the worst case scenario for Brooklyn? If my, if Milwaukee's sitting there in a two seven. I mean, I think they would have to feel confident about what Durant can get. The question is, are all the other guys going to be in positions to score to succeed? Because we've we've seen that play out, right? We've yep. seen that what this matchup looks like, and now PJ Tucker isn't even there to make Durant work for it, which means you're straining Drew Holiday more and Chris Middleton more. I mean, most likely those guys are going to have to have heavy two way shifts all throughout that series, which is just yep. really draining. If you're not going to put that on Giannis, which I don't think you should for a variety of reasons, but so I mean that is tough. But what Milwaukee has is the confidence they can win, and what Philly has is all this emotional charge and baggage because of the dynamics between them and the Nets, that would be, it would be such a weird toss-up kind of series because we all know the Nets are better than their standing and their record. We, I mean, we've seen Kevin Durant go toe-to-toe with pretty much anyone. Yeah. Kyrie Irving has been unbelievable, especially over these last couple weeks when he can play. And no one wants a part of that, least of all the Sixers, even though I'm sure they want to show, you know, teach Ben Simmons something and prove something to themselves and all that. Uh, but Milwaukee is just in a different place. There's, in terms of confidence as an organization, in terms of the lineups they put on the floor, you win a championship, you're in a different place. To take on Brooklyn, I need speed and athleticism. I need to be able to take advantage of the fact that they still don't have the right kind of size, depending yeah. on how you feel about Drummond, who I just do not trust in a playoff series. But ultimately, the kind of team they have probably goes a little smaller. I don't think we're going to see Simmons this year. And I think that might be okay for Brooklyn. I don't know if they necessarily need him because just getting Harden, an unhappy Harden off the team and flipping him for Curry and Drummond might have been just better off for them this year anyway. Sure. Um, the Kyrie piece, who, you know, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about if, what, is this what it would look like if players only played once a week? <laughs> would they, like... Because the Kyrie's, in my opinion, the, this is the best he's ever looked. I always thought he was exceptionally talented. It was the off the court stuff that really, you know, was the issue with him more than anything, and he, just him being unreliable in a variety of ways. But talent wise, I think everybody agrees he's as talented as any guy in the league. And the stuff he did the last couple games makes you think: like, is this what would happen if we had like, if it was like a Premier League season, where it was just thirty five NBA games, and everybody yeah. was at the peak of their athletic powers? Anyway. Milwaukee with Holiday, I think, is in the best position to at least not contain him. But, you know, they have multiple guys that can throw at him and then Giannis protecting the rim. I would think that's the worst matchup for him. Not that there is a worst matchup. but um, And then the Giannis-Durant part, if they cancel each other out, now we're talking role players. And I just like how they shape up in that series. What am I missing? Well, I think the the interesting dynamic there for Brooklyn is they are so small on the perimeter. They have so many guards they're trying to fit into the rotation. That's where guys like Drew and Chris Middleton eat. Yeah, like Chris Middleton will post Patty Mills into the basket. Drew Holiday will body those guys all the way into layups. If they're getting easy baskets out of those kinds of matchups, and again, it's not just Mills. It's, you know, Goran Dragic is in that mix now. You got Seth Curry, who's undersized, obviously. Uh, even Bruce Brown, who's probably the best defender of the bunch. You're giving up a ton of height. Yeah, And so if, you, if you're getting that much height across that many different matchups and you have Giannis, who's just the, biz, the biggest, most physical player on the floor, I think there's a recipe there for Milwaukee to just eat at the rim, to eat on some pretty sustainable, easy baskets all series long. The Utah game is a good example on Monday night. They beat Utah. All three guys played really well. And you think, you know, one of the things when they're really working as a team is three guys who can create a create a shot, especially yeah. in the last five minutes, which is something I talked about the other day with Jackie. Like, it's my fear with the Celtics team. What happens when things really slow down and they just like, Tatum, you're, we're just trapping you every time we're double teaming you. Like somebody else has to beat us. Milwaukee has that covered. So does Brooklyn, honestly. Um, 
there are so many guys, and this is why the East is going to be an amazing playoffs, oh. I think. They, there's just so many guys who can create a shot in the East. <laughs> 